Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. I'm Nisha Bochwe. I'm the Dean here at the Humphrey School, and it's my honor to welcome uh, you to this year's Brandle program featuring many wonderful organizations uh, and friends of the Humphrey School. Over the last few months, as our school looks to update its five-year strategic plan, uh, we have reflected, um, oh, I'm sorry, we've reflected on not only the namesake of our school, uh, but also of John Brandle. As you will hear from the next presenters, John Brandle, who was a dean of the the then, of the then Humphrey Institute, was a model educator, administrator, legislator, and civic leader. He put policy research and practicum into action as a lawmaker, and he was known to work across party lines to advance the common good. I'd like to welcome the friends and family members of John Brandle who are here with us, either in the room or online. We are proud to have John Brandle as part of our school's legacy. Uh, in addition, we have a special note from the governor. And I don't have my phone with the governor's notes. Got it. And so this just came in uh, this afternoon. And so I read, on behalf of Minnesota, I congratulate you on the annual celebration of John Brandle's quest for common good. The Brandle legacy is on full display here today as people across the political spectrum gather to discuss some of the biggest policy questions of the day. As a former Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and a Minnesota legislator, Brandle's legacy is reflected across all levels of nonprofit and government work, including numerous members of my staff. With the many accomplishments of John Brandle, this is an honorable way to remember and preserve the historic significance of all the work he has done over the years. I am proud to see his legacy continue. Sincerely, Tim Waltz, Governor. And we thank Tim Waltz for that recognition um, of John Brandle. Here at the Humphrey School, we make investments in the next generation of public leaders who address some of the greatest challenges before us on issues ranging from politics and governance to urban and regional planning, from childhood policy to technology and environmental sustainability. I'd like to thank the event organizers for today who understand what Hubert Humphrey wanted from the college that would carry his namesake. He wanted a living memorial one that would not only prepare future leaders, but also one that would be a forum for active debate on the policy issues of the day, and an academy that would produce the best research and nonpartisan advocacy based on that research. Today's topic on how to spend Minnesota's $18 billion budget surplus is certainly befitting of the types of conversations that happen here at the Humphrey School. Before we get started, though, most of you likely know about the passing of former Minnesota Senator Dave Durenberger. I'd like to ask Tom Horner, who served with him, to say a few words in memory of the late senator, who will be remembered um, as a leader for promoting bipartisan solutions and civil discourse. Tom. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much. As the Dean mentioned, it was my great good fortune early in my career to work with Senator Durenberger as his press secretary in his first campaign in 1978, um, and then as his chief of staff in, in the Senate. Um, and it was a good uh, break, break for me, um, first of all, because I learned a lot. And secondly, because um, on the, the two days after election day, Dave Durenberger was sworn in to office having won a special election with, with Hubert Humphrey's uh, passing in January of that year. And so I went out to Washington with him. And the very first person I met in Washington was a young, quite lovely um, aide who had worked for Senator Hubert Humphrey and then Senator Mira Humphrey. And 43 years later, Libby and I still are together. So uh, Dave touched my life in ways that uh, no one could have imagined. You know, there has been a lot written about um, Senator Durenberger in the last two days about all that he accomplished, everything from protecting the BWCA to, to passing the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
But as much as he accomplished, one of the lessons we all should learn from, from his life, especially at a forum like this, is how he succeeded in what was even then a partisan and often contentious environment. What made Dave successful as a legislator is that when he faced positions and uh, opinions different from his own, he thought first about what brought people to their positions, secondly, what he could learn from them, and thirdly, where he could inform and teach them to help everyone reach a, a solution. For Dave, it wasn't as much about compromise as it was about collaboration, working together to find the best solution, not just the, the least offensive path. Dave was a big ideas guy who valued effective and efficient government closest to the people. He was conservative on core GOP principles, but a bold thinker who sought new solutions to the challenges of the day. More than anything else though, Dave Dernberger was a public servant who valued public service. No one would have enjoyed today's discussion more than Dave Dernberger. And that's true whether he was up here on the dais or with those of you in the audience with people who truly care about public policy. As we were talking beforehand, among the many things Dave and John Brandel had in common were a great love of good public policy and maybe even a deeper love for St. John's University. Uh, in his 1978 campaign, Dave's slogan was Minnesota's next great senator. I think he fulfilled that promise. He was a good and faithful servant to the people of Minnesota. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Tom. He will truly be missed. Now I'd like to introduce my friend Mitch Perlstein uh, to talk more about John Brandel and the importance of this annual event. Mitch is the founder emeritus of the Center of the American Experiment, along with Steve Young, who is also here today. Mitch served as president there for 25 years. He also served for two years in the U.S. Department of Education during the Reagan and Bush administrations, where he held three positions, including Director of Outreach for the Office of Education, Research, and Improvement. Just prior to his federal service in Washington, Mitch spent four years at an, as an editorial writer and columnist for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, where he focused on foreign and national affairs. Mitch, along with so many others here today, established this annual event to celebrate John Brandel's uncommon quest for common good. He is also a member of our school's honorary council. Please join me in welcoming Mitch Perlstein. Thank you, everybody. Great pleasure getting to know the Dean over the last year or so, and thank you for the kind remarks. And Tom, uh, Dave Dernberger was a friend, as he was a friend of all of ours, and people don't necessarily know he played a pivotal role in the very founding of American Experiment, which I suspect pleases some of you and doesn't necessarily please some others, but he was, he was, he, he was wonderful. And let me say hello to Shelley Brandle. It's always good to see Shelley. And let me say something, as the Dean says, about how this program came to be. And I have four minutes and 30 seconds to hold me to it. Uh, it might have been earlier, but I believe I first met John Brandle in 1981 when he was in the legislature and I was working for Governor Al Qui. And the word in the office was that John was the governor's favorite Democrat, at least before that mantle was shared with Roger Moe. Jump ahead more than four decades. And that enlightened respect and decency between a Republican governor and a DFL legislator has been reflected in the ecumenical spirit we have sought to celebrate in the 15 years of John Brandel's uncommon quest for common ground. As many people in this room recall as well as I do and some better, John was a rigorous and wonderfully affable state legislator, federal official, scholar, teacher, friend, and a man of deep faith. But the greatest driver of our annual celebrations in his name was not just his often remarked upon civility, but his genuine respect for other points of view. Even better was his warm-hearted as well as hard-headed welcoming of eclectic combinations of views. For example, early on, he was a member of American Experiments Board of Advisors, 
Certainly not because he agreed with everything the center believed and sought to accomplish, but because he believed deeply in several of them, especially increased school choice for low-income students, working to reduce the number of fragmented families and taking greater advantage of our religious institutions and traditions in helping people in need. So how more specifically did these annual celebrations come to be? This being our 15th year. When in the spring and summer of 2008, it became clear that John's fight with cancer was nearing its end. About a dozen friends representing a variety of organizations and dispositions began talking about how to mark his exceptional life. After hashing things out twice at one of the most felicitous common grounds in the Twin Cities, uh, the Egg and I at University in 280, we decided to hold annual programs in which we would endeavor to put aside whatever disagreements might divide us throughout the rest of the year, and rather scratch out about 90 minutes in which we might, if not actually reach agreement on something contentious, at least bravely try, as John always did. My reference a second ago to we pertain to the fine concoction of the co-roundtable, Citizens League, Minnesota Free Market Institute, Growth and Justice, and American Experiment. John was in hospice and was to die 10 days later when I met with him seeking his blessing for this ongoing program in his memory. I remain immensely thankful, as we all do, for his grateful smile that afternoon. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce my successor at American Experiment, though he was involved with the center for a long time, uh, John Hinderocker, who has done a remarkable job in expanding the reach and the influence of American Experiment for which I am, where is he? There's some, someplace for which I am terrifically grateful. Thank you all. Did you pick up the piece of paper that has uh, Kate's introduction on it? <laughs> that was plan B, I'll tell you. I have a story about that. <laughs> that, that was uh, my fallback. Uh, so I'm John Hinderocker. I want to just briefly introduce our, uh, our panelists today. Um, I'm going to introduce them and I'll, I'll tell you who they are right now and then I'll give each of them a fuller introduction as they uh, take, the, uh, take the podium. My real role here today is as timekeeper. Each panelist is to talk for five to seven minutes. At the seven minute mark, I will start crumpling up pieces of paper and tossing them at the, at the podium. So that's going to keep us on schedule. So uh, let's welcome our panel. Uh, Kate Semino, Executive Director of the Citizens League. Tom Horner, the co-founder of Himley Horner. Dane Smith, President Emeritus of Growth and Justice. Doug D.J. Tice, Commentary Editor for the Star Tribune. And John Phelan, Economist at Center of the American Experiment. Kate Semino is going to lead off. She is the executive director of the Citizens League, a role she has held since 2020. Prior to leading the league, Kate worked here at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs for over 12 years as executive director of the Humphrey Policy Fellows Program and assistant director of the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance. In the community, Kate is immediate past chair of the board of directors at the nearby McPhail Center for Music, which is the nation's largest community music school. She lives in Minneapolis with her husband and son. Please welcome Kate Semino. Well, there's even a timer here. I could like get that going and then it could. <laughs> well, hello everybody. It's great to be here. And having worked at the Humphrey School for over 12 years, I always love coming back. I always have loved this room. It has a great energy. So good to be here for this important conversation. And let me also add my condolences regarding Dave Durenberger, who was also, in addition to everything um, that others have shared, he was a really good friend of the Citizens League. So we're gathered here today with the question that was posed of how we would spend Minnesota's surplus if it was our money and if doing the greatest good for the greatest number was our goal. And we've also been asked to think about how we would do that invoking the spirit of John Brandel and what has been called his commitment to thoughtful inclusion. Well, I like that because my focus 
personally and at the Citizens League has always been to create great solutions to tough questions like this, what do we do with a surplus, stronger solutions by including a lot of different perspectives, different voices. And that's really been the work of the Citizens League to get people connected to policy, especially those who have experienced policy firsthand and find ways to create those good, strong solutions. So spoiler alert, I'm not actually gonna talk about what I think we should do with the surplus, but rather the process by which the people of Minnesota can be connected to these types of important decisions. Many of you know the Citizens League has had a great model for involving people in this policy work. Some of you I know have been on those committees. They're called study committees and bringing together a group of, a designated group of people, say 20 to 30 people, over a specific span of time. It could, it's usually a pretty long time, six, nine, 12 months or more, um, getting together frequently, sometimes every week, to really dig deep on important policy issues and emerge with really great ideas and solutions. And that has been a great model. That model has developed amazing ideas and innovations. It really is an amazing tool, but it's not perfect because nothing is. And we know that even all good things need to innovate, need to adapt. For example, we started asking ourselves at Citizens League, let's take a policy question like childcare. Let's say we wanted to design creative policy solutions for the childcare crisis. And we wanted to meet every week from 5 to 7 p.m. on Tuesdays for nine months. Who could commit the time to be a part of that? Would it be childcare professionals? Would it be working parents? Would it be members of cultural groups that are really focused on providing community care? That would be really tough. That might be impossible. And we know, if we're being honest, that too many of Citizens League study committees looked like our speaker group here today with the best intentions, but not truly representing the voices of those most connected to these issues. So we knew it was on us to create something new inspired by John Brandel's quest for common good and thoughtful inclusion. And along that way, we also have to acknowledge that the world around us has changed a lot <laughs> in monumental ways. And so to frame this also, because since I'm the first speaker, I figured I could take this chance to name maybe three things of many that have really changed in the world around us that we all need to be mindful of. I'll do it fast. One, this 24 seven culture, anytime, anywhere, work doesn't stop. We have lost some of that shared civic time evenings, mornings, weekends, where people, I think, used to be able to really get together and do this work. Instead, life is happening, work is happening all the time. The flip side of that is that civic engagement can be happening all the time. Learning about policy issues can be happening all the time. So it opens up some new avenues. Here's a number two, a second big trend that we're seeing here. Reduced public trust in government and institutions. It is at an all time low. But that means to me, it's a, there's a willingness to maybe try something new because gosh, what's to lose? And local efforts, local projects where people can connect to each other, learn, have some ideas face-to-face -face locally, that has some potential to build back trust. And third thing, the way we navigate information. You are carrying, I think, you know a supercomputer in your pocket. And if you go to this new uh, interface, this artificial intelligence interface you've been hearing about called ChatGPT, uh, that is the newest artificial intelligence tool, and you type in a question like, what should we do with Minnesota's $17 billion surplus? And you ask it, it will provide you in 45 seconds a complex, nuanced, detailed, <laughs> summary of what you could do. It is astounding. If you haven't checked it out, you need to, uh, it is a proof that the pace and the way that we navigate information has changed in ways that we couldn't even have imagined a year ago. And this brings us to a whole new place. So if you layer all those societal changes over the increasing racial and ethnic diversity of our state, which also cannot be disputed, we have a great space for innovation. 
where people with firsthand experience navigating policy can be part of creating solutions. Okay, so I'm wrapping up. We at Citizens League have been holding design sessions with our board, with our alumni of our Capital Pathways program to design what could that look like if we had an opportunity for people to connect to policy that looked and felt different. They've told us things like this. It needs to be accessible to people of different ages across the spectrum and people of different backgrounds. It needs to be transparent and credible, no behind closed doors. It certainly can't be overly time consuming. People need to be able to connect to policy in a meaningful way, not in a way that is onerous. We're busy, busy people out there doing a lot of work and it needs to be able to be accessible in terms of time. We need to reduce barriers to participation. No one should have to pay like dues to be part of something like this. And ideally, we can build relationships and trust through a participatory tools that we use because that's something we really desperately need. So that's just the start. And we're experimenting and exploring what are different angles that Citizens League could go with this, who could be included, what might it look like? So we're gonna continue to work on that and we hope you'll join us. And I just have one final story. So we had some of our Capital Pathways alumni reviewing some previous study committee reports from the last few years. And one of the questions we asked them was, who had power and influence in this project? So they're reviewing these, these projects where all these people were involved, spent all this time, and I'm like, ooh, who are they gonna say has power and influence? Their response was not what I expected. They said, Citizens League had power in this process. Citizens League chose the topic brought the people together, named the co-chairs, set the meeting time, set the process, wrote the report, published the report. This had been invisible to me. I, I'm ashamed to say it had been invisible to me, the role that Citizens League had in creating the power we had in creating that space. And so I know that we are not neutral in terms of our influence as an organization. We, none of us are neutral. We have power to keep doing things the same way in a wildly changing world, or the power to invite others to work with us to design something new. So let's do it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yep. Thank you, Katie. Next up is Tom Horner. Tom Horner has been involved in Minnesota public affairs for more than 45 years. After graduating from St. Thomas University, Horner started his career in community journalism. In 1978, he joined Dave Durenberger's campaign for the U.S. Senate. After the election, Horner served as press secretary and chief of staff to Durenberger. Returning to Minnesota, Horner co-founded one of the state's most influential public affairs and public relations firms, Himley Horner. In 2010, Horner was the Independence Party candidate for governor. Today, Horner continues his work in public affairs through his firm Horner Strategies LLC and is active in the community, serving on multiple nonprofit boards. Please welcome Tom Horner. Thank you, John. Uh, Kate talked about process. I'm going to start to talk a little bit about the what. How do you apply that process and where do you apply the process? So here's the thing, $17 billion creates an enormous opportunity to do more than just spend it. It creates the opportunity to really change systems, to be transformational, to do things in an entirely different way, to think about how all of these 19th century systems that we've created for a, a time where we were a regional competitor, where it was important to be close to the county seat to get your public service. Um, and now we don't need that so much anymore. The 21st century, has imposed upon us the need to look globally and to have the systems that support that. And keep in mind, it's not just the $17 billion in state surplus money, but it's all of the money that is coming in now through some of the federal programs. So we'll get about a billion dollars a year for infrastructure from the feds. We'll get some money from the um, oddly named Inflation Reduction Act for water projects. We'll get some money from the CHIPS Act, probably, for, for technology. 
there is a lot of money to do a lot of good things. So let me identify three areas where I think Minnesota truly needs to be transformational. The first is our population. And it's not just the diversity of our population, it's the stagnation of our population. In the last fiscal year, Minnesota grew less than 1%, about 5,700 people. And that came following a year in which Minnesota added a grand total, and this is not a misstatement, of 225 people. A state of 5.7 million people added 225 people in a year. The birth rate hasn't recovered from the Great Recession. The national policy on immigration has stopped the flow of new Minnesotans that have been so important to us. And as you can tell by my white hair, we're getting older. And part of it certainly is that we are losing some of our wealthier, older people to sunshine and lower taxes. But talk to the state demographer, and she'll tell you that the biggest problem Minnesota faces in its population is that we're not attracting and retaining the young people, the 20 to 30 year olds, who are our workers, our entrepreneurs, our families. Minnesota's workforce is projected to grow by less, less than one tenth of 1% for the remainder of Governor Walz's term. We can't compete with that. We're losing the, these young people to centers of technology, but also to areas where there are great outdoors environments, great recreational opportunities. In a few years, Minnesota has the potential to be a climate refuge. So one of the things we need to do is think about well, how do we use the greatest natural resource we have as an economic development tool? Water. We have abundant water. It's going to become more and more critically important for safe drinking, for industrial uses, for recreational uses. It is going to be one of the keys in how we attract people. But we're losing that asset. We're not investing in it. We have um, over 3,000 polluted water bodies. And in the first term of Governor Walls, 350 bodies of water were added to that list. In Southern Minnesota, about half of the bodies of water are, are impaired for at least part of the each year. The second big issue is some of our social and, and political infrastructure systems. We have old inefficient systems. And we're trying to hire our way out of these structural failures. So listen to the discussion over at the legislature. Education, well, let's hire more teachers. Public safety, we'll hire more cops. Healthcare, well, we'll hire more workers. They're not there. There aren't the people to hire. We need to think differently about how we use and put to, to good purpose the people that we have. We need to think differently about how we deliver services. So a couple of examples. Minnesota is one of the few states that still delivers a lot of our social services, especially health care, through the counties. Now, there's been some consolidation, but essentially we have, you know, something 80 plus individual health centers that deliver health care. It is inefficient for the clients. It is not transparent for the taxpayers, and it is not accountable to anyone. We need to change that because not only do we deliver the services through the counties, Minnesota is one of the states that has the largest numbers of counties. Enormous overhead. Look at public safety. There are some 450 law enforcement agencies in Minnesota, local, regional, state. 75% of those agencies have fewer than, um, 70, uh, than 25 licensed police officers. That means that we have a lot of cops sitting behind desks when we should have more cops out on the street. We need to think about how we consolidate in big ways. What is the role of the state patrol? Should that be the state's investigative body along with the BCA and let local sheriffs, local police departments patrol highways and streets? Should we have all of our suburban departments merge into one? Do we really need a Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, a Minneapolis Police Department, a University Police Department, a Metro, uh, Metro Police, uh, Transit Police, and a Park Service? Really? 
I don't know. Now we've got problems with different unions. Some are elected, some aren't. But we've got to think big about how we apply resources to where they're needed, not to where they're just administrating. And then there's education. You know, right now, education policy often is driven by hire more teachers. And I'm here to tell you that the most important public policy document in education should not be the local teacher's contract. We've got to figure out how we put outcomes first. And so when you have a lot of parents talk about, well, we need smaller class sizes, and you have teachers talk about, we need smaller class sizes. Maybe what we need is bigger classes. You know, Maybe what we need is to think about the technology that Kate mentioned and others will talk about, I'm sure, to figure out how do we have truly individualized education? Maybe it's 50 students in a class, but they're working in five pods of 10 under a very well-paid, highly trained professional teacher who holds them accountable, who manages them, but allows them to work on individualized learning plans so that that kid who is right at February's lesson is working on February. But you have another pod, they're still trying to figure out October's lessons. Now they can do it. They don't get left behind. And those kids who already are working on April and May, let them thrive, let them prosper. Let's figure out how to use this amazing technology in ways that allow us to use the brilliance of teachers. And so you have that well-paid professional teacher, maybe surrounded by junior teachers or paraprofessionals, so you can give the attention to, to students. But now, instead of just small class size, you have truly individualized instruction. Because to tell you the truth, our schools are not doing the job. And it's not the fault of the teachers. It's not the fault of superintendents. It's not the fault of parents. It's not the fault of students. It's all of our fault. It's our collective fault. It's a system failure. And we need to change that. And the third area is taxes. You know, Minnesota is uncompetitive. Our taxation system has brought us a good life. It has brought us a prosperous life. We have a great quality of life. But we tax as if we still were living in the 60s where our labor force was growing, where the job markets were, 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 were growing. We tax labor, we tax savings. We ought to be taxing consumption. In a global economy in which jobs, capital, ideas are so highly mobile, we ought to be taxing consumption. And it can be done in a way that is progressive, in a way that protects low income people, in a way that allows Minnesota to be Minnesota. We need to make those kinds of changes. And these are going to be hard, but here's the thing that I wanna end with before John starts throwing papers at me as he's crumpling it up. Uh, you know, Minnesota, like the country, always is a state in the making. We're never satisfied. We never should be satisfied with where we're at. We're a state in the making. Now's our opportunity to look at how we make the future in a truly transformational way. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next up is Dane Smith. Dane is a former reporter for the Minneapolis Star Tribune and president emeritus of Growth and Justice. Dane? Thanks, John, and thanks, colleagues, for sustaining this forum, especially Steve. Um, John Brandle was a mentor, a personal mentor, and trusted advisor for growth and justice. He was a voice for social justice in a more effective and a more effective public sector. Uh, and to me, his most memorable words were, good intentions are not enough. I really appreciated uh, what Tom had to say about uh, thinking differently and uh, and but I, I would want to talk a little bit more about the basics of this of the of the surplus situation. And to the question, my preference for allocating the surplus aligns approximately with the will of the Minnesota electorate and with the governor and the legislative majorities that this electorate elected just three months ago. Principles first and then some specifics. Most Minnesotans, I think, do understand at some level that rising economic inequalities over the last couple of decades and historic racial, racial inclusion underlie many of our problems. Most also believe in climate science and climate action, and they believe intuitively that their state government 
does do good and absolutely necessary things as much as it could use reform and rethinking all the time. The budget proposed by Governor Walls is a strong affirmation of our state constitutional requirement that ensures, quote, security, benefit, and protection of the people, unquote. All the people is implied here, not just those with the most property and income. Minnesota has long been better off than most other states in most ways, owing to a history of bipartisan public mindedness and a distinctive egalitarian spirit. But we're coming off a period of historic upheaval and chaos. A pandemic that killed almost 14, has killed already 14,000 Minnesotans and is still with us. A generational shift that has left us with a severe workforce shortage and unrest rooted in too much poverty and disparity and injustice and a worsening global climate crisis. But we also have full employment, profitable businesses, a better growth rate than most other states, a record state surplus created in part by a massive federal government rescue funded by both Republican and Democratic presidents to stave off economic co collapse. And as bold as the Walls budget is, in addressing these biggest problems, it is not radical or unprecedented. It follows a basic formula advanced by governors with surpluses in both parties since way back. One, invest more in public goods and services that improve our human capital and our public infrastructure and our natural environment, all of which are pro-business propositions. Two, save some for the inevitable next downturn. And three, when surpluses are sufficient, return some with one-time rebates or tax rate cuts, credits, or deductions. Now, on balance, the net tax reductions from the governor's proposal amounts to, best I can count, about $6 billion, or more than a third of the projected surplus, most of it flowing to the middle and low-income households. Minnesotans over the next two years would, under his proposal, see an average net savings in their state tax obligations on the order of almost 1,000 for each person in the state. I don't necessarily agree with all of the tax proposal. The Social Security exemption in its current form ought to be targeted to lower incomes, but the increased child credits, the education deductions, and the one-time rebates are highly progressive in their impact. Rebates and credits of a couple thousand dollars means a lot for a family of four in North Minneapolis, a lot more than for an affluent retiree like myself. This cash will be particularly helpful for households in greater Minnesota where both incomes and cost of living trends tends to be lower. The largest slice uh, on the uh, new outlay side in the proposed budget, and the only proposal we have, by the way, um, is support for children and their parents, education. Not just a formula increase, but new investments in reading comprehension, improving basic competencies, and more for rigorous content in high schools. A major increase is proposed for childcare assistance for working parents, which happens to be a top priority uh, for the coalition of greater Minnesota cities. There's a lot of new funding focused on workforce skills and training, especially for occupations where uh, our shortages are most acute, such as elderly care, child care, and health care in general. Public safety is another big slice. Walls proposes $300 million for uh, more direct public uh, safety aid for local governments with wide latitude in how they invest it. Our urban core gets all the attention and blame for the crime spike, but it's actually a statewide phenomenon and hopefully a temporary setback after years of declining crime rates. For many communities, this new money will mean more and better trained police, but also prevention and smarter juvenile justice, keeping in mind Tom's great ideas about <laughs> collaborating among police and, and uh, reducing uh, some of the uh, multiplicity uh, an overlay of, of departments. By the way, um, uh, for many communities, this new money means more and better trained police, uh, but smarter juvenile justice. And I'd like to commend the American Experiment in its latest magazine for celebrating a new model diversion program in Hennepin County for mentally ill and chemically dependent. There's new funding, uh, a lot of new funding in this area. 
Healthcare gets a big slice in the budget, uh, the Walls budget. We've made progress in recent years, but 300,000 Minnesotans still lack health insurance. New funding is proposed to reduce that number, uh, provide more preventive care, especially to children, improving access to addiction treatment and mental health, and to things like sober housing and to recovery from long COVID. There's a new special emphasis on reducing the disturbing health disparities for indigenous and black Minnesotans. Alleviation of our affordable housing shortage and homelessness gets more attention from this proposed budget. Surplus dollars also move aggressively towards renewable energy, creating many more new green jobs, electrification of our economy, more public transportation options for both Metro and greater Minnesota. Finally, I like what Tom Horner had to say in this morning's Star Tribune about Dave Durenberger's nearly final words to the effect that government is, quote, not a nuisance and not an evil force. Most Minnesotans understand the enormous good that our governments do and their, uh, that our governments and their workers do at every level, day in and day out, around the clock. Polling consistently shows that folks may say they may not like or trust the government. They often mean they don't like politics and discourse, and they don't like the party that's in power. But when asked specifically about the things that government does, they want it, and often they want at least a little more, and sometimes a lot more. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, Dane. Next up is DJ Tice. DJ Tice is the commentary editor and an opinion columnist for the Star Tribune based in Minneapolis. He has been a writer, editor, and publisher in Twin Cities journalism for more than four decades. Tice was previously an editor at Corporate Report Minnesota and Twin Cities magazines, editor and publisher at the Twin Cities Reader, and an editorial writer and columnist for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. From 2003 to 2009, he was the Star Tribune state political editor, directing coverage of the legislature, state government, the Minnesota congressional delegation, and elections. He is the author of two books of popular history. His collection of Ordinary Minnesotans' Memories, Minnesota's 20th Century, published by the University of Minnesota Press, was awarded the Minnesota Book Award for History in 2000. Please welcome DJ Tice. Well, thanks very much. <clears throat> Great pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, as I look around the room, I almost feel as if I ought to call a staff meeting to order. <laughs> Substantially, all of our uh, presenters today have written more than once, many times, uh, for us at the Star Tribune, and I'm very, very proud of that and proud to be here today. Also pleased and proud to recall that I knew John Brandle and worked with him in various ways, both when he was at the legislature uh, and here when he was here at the Humphrey School. John, of course, was a man who thrived and did great good in both of those uh, different uh, arenas. And I always remember the way he talked about straddling those two worlds. Uh, at one point, years after he'd left the legislature and was, and was here at the university, he was back at the Capitol testifying about a bill or a budget issue. Uh, and uh, he was being well ensconced by then in the academic world. He took the opportunity to tell his colleagues that after years of working in an arena of bitter ideological combat, where very little respect was shown for opposite points of view, it was always a great relief for him to be back at the legislature where he found a much more open-minded approach to politics. Um, I'm gonna take the risk of being a little bit of a skunk at the garden party here today. Uh, my original intention was to dive in and join the big idea festival that seems to be the, uh, the spirit of the season and I've got nothing against big ideas, we need them. But, uh, uh, Dane, you mentioned John's uh, good intentions are not enough. They actually, the title of his book was Money and Good Intentions Are Not Enough. And of course, we've got a lot of money and a lot of good intentions. And the general feeling seems to be that what we need to add to that mix are big ideas. 
Uh, but I think maybe we need to remember some small ideas too, some small ideas about the, the basic blocking and tackling of government and press our leaders to focus on that. This is brought to mind for me by a couple of stories that just happened to break the stories of particular interest to me just in the, in the last 24 hours. <clears throat> and they're based on uh, announcements from two of the most credible institutions, I believe, in Minnesota public life, the Office of the Legislative Auditor and the Minnesota Supreme Court. Yesterday, well, I'm sorry, this morning, the Office of the Legislative Auditor uh, released an evaluation report, uh, oversight of state-funded grants to nonprofit organizations. Now, there are a lot of grants to nonprofit organizations, and what may come to mind for you is the freedom uh, or the uh, feeding our future scandal of last year. That, of course, was a federal program administered not very well by the state, uh, but the state itself gives hundreds of millions of dollars to nonprofit organizations. And here's what the Office of the Legislative Auditor said just yesterday. The Office of the Legislative Auditor has found pervasive non-compliance by state agencies with grants management policies in recent years. And statutes provide little authority to enforce agencies' compliance with these policies. Makes you wonder how anything could go wrong. Now, it seems to me this is a bit of a problem. And it also seems to me that this is a problem our public officials ought to be able to solve. They may not have the answer to the crime problem. They may not have the answer to educational disparities. They may not even have the answer to climate change or racism, but they should be able to get the state agencies to comply with the very policies state government puts forward and they're not doing it. So let's find a little bit of our energy in this season of big ideas to focus on that small but important idea. The state Supreme Court issued a ruling yesterday. <clears throat> this was on involving the Minnesota Sex Offender Program. This is a program that has been involved in controversy and litigation since the day it was created about 30 years ago. And I think it is safe to say that among civil liberties advocates in the United States uh, who care about due process, even for people who have committed crimes and have served their time and have been essentially dumped in <clears throat> the black hole of Calcutta because we're afraid of them, people who care about such things believe Minnesota's sex offender program is the most unjust in the country. Enlightened places like Texas are a model that they often suggest we follow. The case that came up yesterday uh, before the Supreme Court involved two patients of the sex offender program who have not only served their time in prison, but been in the program for decades, have gone through all of the steps that are required for them to be moved not into the community, but into a somewhat less restrictive form of custody and a special court that the state has created to review these cases ordered that they be moved to that lower level of custody. It has not happened. It has not happened for years. The state simply refuses to do it. And the case that came before the Supreme Court asked, is there any limit to the state's ability to decide when and if ever people should be moved into the, the next step of the program when a court says they should. The Supreme Court unanimously said yes, in an opinion written by Justice Paul Thiessen, uh, himself of impeccable progressive credentials, I dare say, served in the legislature for many, many years. And he wrote, state officials <clears throat> make the startling claim that there is no broad requirement that litigants must always comply with court orders and that what action, if any, a court order requires depends on the surrounding factual circumstances. In other words, it really depends on whether they feel like it. He was a little incredulous about this. 
the state claimed that they couldn't move these people to the next level of the program because they didn't have bed space. And this lack of bed space apparently went on for years. And Thiessen writes, it is certainly within the power of the legislature to fund sufficient bed space to provide the services that the legislature itself requires. Sounds reasonable, but it's not happening. And I just want us to get a little bit down to earth. Let's, it's great to have a vision. Let's start with a vision of competence and lawfulness in our government. And then we can move on to solving all of our vast problems. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Last up among our presenters is John Phelan. John Phelan is an economist at Center of the American Experiment. He is a graduate of Birkbeck College, University of London, where he earned a BSc in economics and of the London School of Economics, where he earned an MSc. John worked in finance for 10 years before becoming a professional economist. He worked at Capital Economics in London, where he wrote reports ranging from the impact of Brexit on the British economy to the effective government regulation on cell phone coverage. John has written for City AM in London and for the Wall Street Journal in both Europe and the US, as well as newspapers across the Midwest. He has also been published in the journal Economic Affairs. Please welcome John Phelan. Um, hello there, everybody. I'm just gonna make, see if I can get the timer to work. There we go. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am probably a bit less interesting than the other people you're going to hear from. I'm more of a, a numbers guy. Um, I tend to deal in spreadsheets. Um, and so I've got some uh, pictures and graphs and charts that you're going to see coming up. Um, just to give you uh, kind of a quick version, um, if anybody has to get off early, um, the question is, what should we do with the state government surplus, budget surplus? Um, and my answer is that we shouldn't do anything with it. We should give it back to the people it's forecast to come from in the form of permanent tax rate cuts. Um, I should qualify that and say that I'm not talking about $17.6 billion. I'm talking about the structural share of the forecast surplus, which is $6.3 billion in the upcoming biennium, uh, rising to $8.4 billion after that. Um, so why is that? I'm gonna give you some explanation of why I believe that's the case. Um, Minnesota used to be the state that worked. Um, this is a picture here, and you may remember the uh, Time magazine uh, article from 1973, when Landerson with a fish. Um, this year is uh, President Barack Obama in 2015. He went to the University of Wisconsin in La Crosse, and he said, uh, um, he pointed across the river uh, from Wisconsin to Minnesota, and he said, there's the state that works. So as recently as 2015, people were still saying, Minnesota is the state that works. Um, this is two years before I moved here, by the way. Um, the accent, I'm, I, like I say, I'm an immigrant uh, to Minnesota, and the accent is not just something I put on for the kids. Um, but as recently as 2015, as recently when I was arrived in this state, um, people would say, you know, Minnesota is the blue state that, that works. It, it shows that things work. It shows that the model of high taxes and big government spending uh, produces something close or as close um, to a paradise as we are about to see in the United States. I don't think people would say that now, um, a few years on. Um, we've gone through some fairly traumatic experiences in the state the last few years, um, not the least of which uh, the riots that followed the murder of George Floyd in 2020. Um, and this here is, uh, I thought was an interesting thing. It was written by Professor Samuel L. Myers in the Pioneer Press in 2021. Uh, when he talked about uh, racial disparities and he talked about wide racial disparities in virtually every social and economic indicator in Minnesota. Um, uh, the, the, some of the examples here, graduation rates, home ownership rates, loan denial rates, mortality rates. I've only got a few minutes, so I'll stop reading there. Um, but what that tells you there, oh, uh, we may have lost the thing there. Um, but what that tells you, I think, um, shows you some of the issues that we have. I shall plow on anyway. Um, so it's worth noting. That's <laughs> okay. Well, it's worth noting, I think, that um, uh, all this happened while Minnesota was a high tax, 
high spending state. Yeah, that's the, that's the word I'm going to say. Um, so all these issues arrived, arose, all these problems arose. While Minnesota had uh, high levels of taxation, very progressive taxation, some of the highest rates of tax and most progressive rates of tax in the United States. All of the problems that were identified in terms of racial disparities in that op-ed either arose while taxes in Minnesota were high and progressive, or they proved resistant to solution by taxes that were high and progressive. And just if you don't believe me, here's uh, Governor Tim Waltz just a week or so ago saying Minnesota has always been progressive in its taxation with an expectation that people pay their fair share and those that have more pay their fair share, fair share too. So this is not a new thing. We have tested the model to destruction. I believe that we can build paradise on earth or paradise in Minnesota at least uh, with high taxes and high rates of government spending. And I got down there in the bold text, high tax, high spending policies have failed even in their own terms. So uh, I'm not much given to quoting Lenin. Um, every now and then I do it. What is to be done is a crucial question. Um, I've got here a quote. I wrote about this in the Star Tribune um, a year or so ago, or maybe a bit longer than that. Um, and one of the responses I had was that most advocates for racial equity actually want Minnesota to more aggressively apply our egalitarian and liberal traditions, not abandon them in favor of individualism and conservative denial of white privilege. Um, in other words, and I've got a gif here, more. Um, so any problems we've got, we just need to spend more. If we've got problems, it's because we're not spending enough and we need to spend more and that we have an opportunity to do so with this surplus. There are problems with this. Um, this here is a paper, uh, Taxation and Migration, Evidence and Policy Implications, uh, written by a number of economists. It appeared in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, and I say that um, because I have been told to my face by legislators that this research does not exist. So I've got a picture of it there to prove it does. I testified uh, about a proposed tax hike um, a session or two ago, and the legislator said that evidence doesn't work, that that's not true, that the evidence doesn't say that. I held the paper up and she said, well, it's a National Bureau of Economic Research paper. It's not a peer reviewed article. And I said, well, the reason it's an NBER paper I'm holding up is because that's the one it's free to download. I have to pay to download the other one. Um, but here it is, here's the front page of it anyway. And this is the key finding from this paper. There is growing evidence that taxes can affect the geographic location of people both within and across countries. This migration channel creates another efficiency cost of taxation with which policymakers need to contend when setting tax policy. Now, this is a review of the literature. So this is not people necessarily doing their own research. This is people assessing all the research that's been done in this field. And what's interesting, if you read the paper, it's well worth it. They're not actually very pleased to come to this finding, you can tell. Um, but they are honest enough to say that that is the finding. Uh, now, we already see this exodus from Minnesota. This has been mentioned by previous speakers. You see here, um, this has not shown up quite as well as I would have liked. Um, this is net domestic migration um, from, the, from and to various states um, in the year 2021 to 2022. Um, you'll see here, the red ones are the states that are losing people on net. This is net domestic migration. And the green states up there are the states that are gaining people. Now you'll see Florida gained something like 320,000 residents in that one year. You'll see that Texas gained something like 300,000 residents in one year. Uh, you'll see that California there lost 343,000 residents. New York lost 300,000 residents. This is in one year. And you'll see Minnesota is one of these red bars down here. Uh, we lost 19,400 residents to other parts of the United States between mid-2021 and mid-2022. That was the highest rate that we've lost in at least 30 years. It broke the previous record, which was set the year before. Um, so this is not a new thing. We've been losing residents on net since about the turn of the century, but the pace of exit is quickening. Um, now, it's not just snowbirds. I often say, uh, when I point to this data out, people say, well, it's all just you know, old people retiring and moving off to Arizona or somewhere. Well, that's not true. Uh, this chart here uses internal revenue service data to break down by age group the net flows into and out of Minnesota. Uh, that red bar up here, that's all ages. So this is the year 2021, uh, 2011, 2012 to 2019, 2020. Um, and that red bar down the end shows that on net we lost 26,807 residents uh, to other parts of the US over this period. And you'll see the age groups that we lost them in. We lost age, uh, people in the age group under 26, not that many, 200 and odd, 
Um, but this is not somewhere that young people are flocking to. It's just not somewhere that young people are coming. We do gain in the age group 26 to 35. You'll see there about 20,000 on that over this period. But above that, above 35 years old. So again, we're not talking about snowbirds here. Above 35 years old, we start to lose people in every age group. So 45 to 55. This is people in the prime of their working lives. At least I hope so, because I'm nearly in that category. Um, so you'll see there people losing, uh, we are losing people in all these categories. So it's not just snowbirds, this is people in the prime of their working lives, leaving Minnesota for other parts of the United States. Um, and they are leaving for taxes, uh, for states with lower taxes. Um, this here shows you the, uh, that chart previously broken down by the states that people went to and the states that people came from. You'll see the places that we gained residents from, the top one, Illinois, we gained about 12,000 residents from Illinois on net over this period. Um, you move two down, uh, you get to New York. So we gained a lot of residents from New York. These are some of the few states in the United States with higher taxes than we have. So we get people coming in from there. When you look down the other end, the red bars, that's the states that we lose people to. You're looking at Florida, where we lost something like 20,000 residents on net over this period. Um, Texas is the third one. Arizona's up there as well. Um, but you see there that we are gaining people from states, the few states with higher taxes than us, and we're losing people to the states that actually in some cases have no income tax at all. Um, now you've got here, um, I'll come back to these two that I skipped, some of the states that we gain the most from, North Dakota and Iowa. Now you'll notice North Dakota certainly has lower taxes than we do, so tax isn't the only thing that goes into all this, but it's a factor certainly, as the research finds. And so when you look at North Dakota here and Iowa next to it, what you find is that people will move to Minnesota from lower tax states, but they won't move very far. They'll move up the road across the borderline. But people will move a substantial distance to get away from it, down to Florida, Arizona, Texas, uh, and Washington, uh, which is another uh, zero income tax state. Um, so this shows something that we really need to be aware of. One thing when I point this out is people say to you, uh, high taxes don't guarantee you a better quality of life. I can hear the gong about to ring for me. Um, this here shows you that that's not the case. Uh, there is actually no statistically significant relationship between tax burden and the quality of life. So forget about that. Um, tax cuts do spur economic growth. This is a summary of the research papers on the subject. Um, and so what should we do with it? Um, I've got here a slightly more detailed um, explanation in which we would cut income tax rates either by cutting every rate across the board or by eliminating the lowest income tax rates. And you'll find that if we do the one, it moves us from 45 to 44th on the bit of the state, the tax foundation state business tax climate index, or the other one doesn't move us at all because our taxes are already so high. The point being that these measures are modest because I guarantee someone will come up and say, well, this is extreme fiscal nonsense. It's not at all. Um, that gets me to the end. Um, and I will say thank you very much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, we're now going to take some questions from the audience. And to handle that part of our program, I want to introduce uh, Steve Young, my good friend. Uh, Steve Young is the head, the director, the president of the Co Round Table for Moral Capitalism. Did I say that right here in the United States? And his even greater distinction is that he was the very first chairman of the board of the Center of the American Experiment, uh, for which he uh, is always remembered. So, uh, Steve Young. Thank you, John. Go ahead. Thank you, very much. Thank you. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have two options for questions, and I'm, I want to pick one, if I may. One option is there are pieces of paper in a box back there, and people can write out their questions, and then I can sort of read them as, as Megan gives them to me. But looking at you all in the size of the crowd, I think we can just use the mic. And Megan will walk around with the mic. So maybe you can just you know, put your hand up. I will try to, I will take names. I'll put together a queue and call on you. And um, you can either have a question for you know, one of our presenters or a question in general, and then I will sort of direct it to somebody. I also, for the presenters, reserve the right that if somebody answers the question, and I think somebody else might have an interesting response, I might call on them too. But before I do that, I would like to um, make, make two sort of personal comments. My last conversation with David Dernberger was about this session. I had called David last fall after I'd called my colleagues 
because, okay, as you were talking, we live in a time of change. And, and I think it's very difficult for us Americans these days to come to grips with the fact that not all changes are betterments. Not all changes lead us closer to the millennium or something like that. And we've had changes in our makeup and things like that. So I was talking to people. Um, this, this, this effort, and, and John Brandle has not been with us for a long time. The younger people don't know who John Brandle is. Do we continue? And David's response was, of course you continue. So I want to thank the Dean and everyone else for allowing us to continue. My other thought was sitting here and what's going on is up there. But I once gave a class in this room with uh, Paul Stone. Of, we were teaching political theory or something like that. And the class was sitting in here and I walked in. My dad had been a friend of Hubert Humphreys and I saw the thing for freedom. So I asked the class, I, it was related to it. And I sort of said, any of you folks remember any movement songs? And I had blank faces, all these Humphrey students, Dean. And I was at the end of the march from Selma. And I still remember, I can't sing, but I can remember a few movement songs. But I sort of wanted to sort of create a sense for Hubert Humphrey and these students in the country. And nobody knew any movement songs. So time passes, time flies. And, and what is, we're an older group here today. What is our responsibility in passing on a heritage, a legacy? So that was in my mind, listening to all the good ideas we have. But any questions, or also, by the way, short comments. But I'll cut you off real fast if the comments get a little bit too long. Megan is back there with the mic. Yes, Michael. Thank you guys very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, the comments. I, and um, I have a, a question, and I don't, I don't know who to send it to. Maybe I'll go with Steve, and you can dish it out as you see fit. Um, I'm going to start with the notion that um, without a conception of the common good, democracy makes no sense. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking that this is the theme here, trying to make sense of what, uh, what this money means, trying to make sense of what our values are. And I would just like us to think about um, four points that have been made. Um, number one was the, this first set about the need to think about diversity. And, could you uh, respond to this notion? Does diversity make any sense if it's not also, um, if it doesn't also incorporate a sense of unity? Um, and there was another question about people coming and going into Minnesota. And um, uh, my training is, is actually in philosophy and economics also. Um, and I've often believed that economics without mathematics is religion. And I, uh, I have to wonder about the religion, you know, the deep beliefs that are suggested here in the charts that were given, um, because there are an awful lot of numbers that are missing, um, not the least of which is from your country and the research on Brexit. <laughs> which pretty much says austerity and the way in which people refuse to spend certain kinds of things uh, has pl placed the um, United Kingdom in a situation where the standard of living is approaching Poland. Michael, uh, thank you. Can I? Okay, and then I'll, then I'll break them up into pieces. This, this is the one that goes back to Tom, which I think... This might be the most important one, and that is the idea of systems and looking at the systems. 
But what seems to be missing in the discussion is the individual within the system. And um, basically ethics only live in the individual. You cannot delegate an ethical decision that's yours. However, an individual cannot be moral alone and so needs the system. But there's a, there's a, a synergy here that I don't see us talking about much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I have a number of things. Can I get maybe one or two questions and I'll try to cut them up and give them to the panel? Let's see, John, maybe quickly. Yes. The microphone is coming. Uh, I'm John Palmer, Professor Emeritus from uh, Dave Nuremberg's home area, St. Cloud State. My question is this How much freedom should people be? given to protect their wealth? Fundamental question. How much freedom should people be given to protect their wealth? Okay, thank you very much. Um, if I can sort of chop these up and, and give them out. Um, uh, Tom Horner, uh, could I ask you, can there ever be a democracy where there is no sense of a common good? Uh, Megan, maybe you can, yeah, yeah, Megan, yeah. Megan, can we, can we pass the mic up here? Sure, Tom, thank you. If there can be, I don't think we've achieved it yet. So I, I guess based on experience, I would say no, but then you get into the more thorny question of what is the common good, who defines the common good? How do we, how do we collectively, uh, um, uh, identify that that common good and then how do we achieve it and i think that's the bigger challenge of, of democracy thank you um kate you made some references about uh diversity as part of the changes um can you have diversity and unity at the same time thanks for that question michael uh that's a real it's a it's a great question i think when, when i think about that question as you phrased it does diversity make any sense without unity what comes to mind for me is that differences matter and togetherness also matters. It is important that we can honor the diversity and differences of people in any group, in any state, in any country, and also believe and work to create a sense that we are all in this together with all our differences. And, and sometimes, I think that this whole conversation gets too convoluted when to me it's it's there's those simple pieces that make it work. You can be different and also be part of something together. Um, the other flip on that, which um, Tom made me think of is, you know, Dane and I might both have a family and be part of a family, but what family means to each of us might feel and look different. The way we think about our family, what we do together, how we spend time with them, what it means to us personally. But we can both agree that family is important. So it doesn't have to be exactly the same for both of us to value it and hold it as, um, as important to us and important to our community. Thank you, Kate. Uh, John Phelan, um, the man who put numbers and, and graphs up there, the sense I might interpret is so. Is there not a countervailing factor to money in our deeply held beliefs, in our religions? That's where I thought the question was coming from. Would people be moving not because for money reasons, but because of what, what, what was, um, emotional, cultural reasons, et cetera, et cetera, belief systems? Oh, I'm sure there's all sorts of reasons that people move. Um, so for example, uh, you know, South Dakota, for example, that had uh, an inflow of people last year and that generally has an inflow of residents. So, you know, people talk about the weather, for example. Um, you know, I think that kind of proves that. Um, that that's not the case. But also, if you look at some things, you know, I mean, there are cultural amenities that you will have in a place like uh, Minnesota, which I, I mean, without being kind of chauvinistic, I'm not sure that the neighboring states necessarily have some. So, yeah, um, I, I do think there are cultural amenities in a state like, uh, in a town like Minneapolis that um, are not necessarily there in neighboring states. Um, so, if you said to me, would I want to, move tomorrow from Minneapolis to somewhere in South Dakota. I mean, I'd save a lot of money on taxes, but you give a lot, give a lot up on that. Um, so it's not just the one thing. 
we're not talking about one thing explains all this. And I think if anybody tells you that, they're probably trying to spin you a line. Um, it's one factor of many, and we cannot deny that it is a factor. And that's what the research shows. Um, and, you know, I think when you're looking at a state in a situation where there is so much competition, you can't afford to ignore a factor like that. Um, so you can't oversell it, but you can't ignore it either. Um, and that too often is done, I think. Thank you, John. Um, Doug, could I turn to you to sort of pick up on the point of systems versus individuals? Since you were talking about the Supreme Court opinion on the custodial powers of the state versus individualism. I mean, do we individuals, do we actually count for anything anymore? I think the, <clears throat> the basic tension of American life was probably uh, best expressed by Lincoln who said America was conceived in liberty and dedicated to a proposition, proposition being the equality of human beings. And what's often missed in that, that construction, I think, is that there's a tension between those things. If we have individual liberty to pursue happiness, however we perceive it, including lower taxes, if, if that's what floats our boat, uh, and that's going to come into conflict with this sense of the of the common good, because what does equality mean? It can mean lots of different things, including equality of condition, uh, relative equality of condition for some people. So those two things in American life are always in tension. Where does freedom leave off and equality begin? Uh, in Lincoln's time, slavery was the great overwhelming challenge uh, to resolving that. In our time, fortunately, it's not quite that difficult, but the resolution is still hard to find. Uh, Dane, uh, uh, John's question, if you could reflect on, uh, the freedom to protect my wealth and advance my wealth, is that a valuable freedom? Is it a, is it a what? Is it a valuable freedom? Or, is, or do we have to... Or, can you even judge what I want to do with my freedom? Uh, I don't know. I would argue it's, of course, you have a freedom to, uh, in a democracy, to advocate, to uh, protect your wealth and, and your privilege. Um, but that is not a problem in the United States of America. Uh, uh, all, the all the indicators are that um, wealth is increasingly concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. The gap between the rich and the poor has increased. Uh, this is not a right that seems to be in any jeopardy whatsoever. Um, what we need is a is a is a distribution of wealth that reflects uh, uh, basic moral and religious principles that we're all God's children. Thank you very much. I think we're about out of time. Maybe one more question. Yes, please. One of the things I've heard here, kind of an overriding principle, is that growth is good and lack of growth is bad. And maybe this intersects with the whole thing about the balance of wealth in our country. If all of us, if, if we've got a, a, a world that already has more people than it's designed to hold, and I think the research shows that, then why would we want to get bigger and bigger and bigger? And what happens is we have an economic system that enables people to take advantage of other people if there are too many workers around. And hence their value goes down and it increases the disparity between all the people. So maybe if we are forced to deal with the people that we have, maybe people would be employed and paid on a much more equal basis. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna split that into two people and I'm not flipping a coin. I'm uh, Kate, um, issues of growth, non-growth, uh, circular economy, small is better. Uh, you're with the Citizens League. You're out there talking to all these people. What are your thoughts? And then, Tom, maybe you could be our anchor person, please. Um, I, uh, you know what? In the interest of, of focus and time, I don't know that I have much to add to this. Um, I'm going to defer to Tom. 
<laughs> okay, Tom, the, bur the, 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 bur the burden has just got tougher for you. John, you have a comment? Okay, and then, and, okay, oh, yeah, there you go. And then, and then John, John, excuse me, Megan, we'll quickly, we'll go to John after Tom. Yeah. But Tom first. I, I mean, I, I, I think growth is essential. I think the fundamental question is not to grow or not, or, or whether we should grow or not grow. The question is how we grow and how we invest resources. How can we grow in a way that is sustainable? How can we grow in a way that is respectful of the, the inequities that Dane and others have, have identified to start to close those gaps, to make sure that we are a more um, equitable society? Um, I, I don't think that, that we as a state or a nation or a world for that matter can afford not to grow. I mean, they, look at the what, what has occurred for all of the challenges that we've had. Look what has occurred over the last generation just in the dramatic reduction of global poverty and hunger. What, what, what an incredible feat for all of the challenges that we have with climate change and energy. Look what we've done over the last generation to expand economic production while we're reducing energy consumption. Not enough, much more to be done. We've made an enormous strides. And so I think we're, we're kind of starting to, to put in balance that question of how do we grow? And how do we make sure that we're doing it in, in sustainable and smart ways? Thank you. John, you're okay? Yeah. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming to the John Brando program. Dean? So I just want to add my thanks and um, appreciation uh, to Steve and the organizers again for this program. Uh, John Brandle uh, was a foundational uh, part of the Humphrey School. We honor his legacy um, in this program as we've continued this year and look forward to continuing these important conversations um, over the next number of months. I also want to invite you to join us on February 28th to the State of the School Address. Uh, that will take place here in the Humphrey School. Please, please, please join us. We look forward to um, not just your presence, but your conversation thereafter at the lunch that will follow. Have a nice evening.